subject. We talk now this afternoon about uh, volcanic earthquakes and uh, both due to dikes and also a little bit to magma chambers and also focal mechanisms. This is what we have this one. Ah. Something wrong with the view. Yeah. Okay. So we will start by talking about uh, the, I think it's still now, the biggest seismic swarm ever due to in a volcanic, in a volcano, which is this one. It occurred in Japan. Here uh, there is no map, but there will be a map later, so I will show you where it is. This is a volcano, it's offshore. Tokyo is about uh, north uh, at some distance here, and here is mainland Japan like this. And this is in the, in the ocean, and uh, it is an area relatively close to uh, a triple junction where the subduction from the Filipino plate goes into one direction and there is another subduction in, one, in another direction and this causes kind of some extension in the direction that you see the dike. So again here is more or less consistent with what you would expect. This was a dike that started here, so this is time. This is 26 of June in 2000 and this is the volcano. Uh, this is that. Consider that, uh, so here it appears that actually most of the seismicity is quite deep. It was deep, probably not so deep, not as deep as shown here because uh, these um, locations were uh, obtained only using land stations, but then the Earthquake Research Institute in Tokyo, they installed also OBSs, uh, so ocean bottom seismometers, they, they put them down uh, on, the, on top of the dike, and the locations that can be obtained with that instru those instruments, they told me they rise up, but uh, they, these locations are not available, so I cannot give them to you, but anyway, so they are deep, but not this deep. So as you can see from the seismicity, we saw this uh, kind of pattern already. Uh, the seismicity migrates. It follows kind of the tip of the dike, and you can see it here. We will have other figures because uh, basically this is, has been plotted in every paper since. Um, and then happens, uh, many, many things happen in this episode. It's actually a very interesting episode. Um, the dike propagates, and then it stops suddenly. It goes more or less constant velocity, something like that. It stops, and when it stops, already there is a question why it exactly stopped. But where it stops, you can see here actually, is this earthquake occurs. It's like one week of propagation and then you have a magnitude 6.4, like a relatively large one for a volcano and a, a dike. Like even the Bardarbunga dike that was large, I think it, the, it didn't even reach five. And I think also in Alpha there were not much, really very, very large. Like I think maybe there was one this size, but uh, barely. Um, okay, so then what happened is that the dike uh, stalled, but then magma chamber was continuing to pump magma into it because one could see that the seismicity was continuing really intense. Uh, in fact, just uh, kind of almost 10 days later, there was another magnitude 6.1, uh, and then even weeks later, there was a 6.3, another 6, and another 6.4. So it continued to also, and um, one can see from this figure, which shows the so the green line is the cumulative number of uh, earthquakes with magnitude larger than 3. Many, many. So here we are talking about 6,000. 
earthquake larger than three in 2000. I mean, nowadays with the monitoring capability of that time, it was really large. And here, these blue dots are the distance between this island and this island. Here is the island where the dike was originated and it went this way. So you can see that the dike propagates and these islands start to actually move apart, the two islands, this one and this one. You can see it from the GPS arrows yeah. that they are starting to move apart because... Uh, yeah. So it's a still distant, it doesn't really go between the islands, but still they feel this, uh, this motion. Actually it goes a little bit like this and this, you know, a bit oblique. And this is the distance between the, the two islands, which increases. And then of course, every time you have a magnitude six, there is like a little step in the distance because this is also contributing. But except for that, you can see that distance really increases anyway, you know? And then you have some steps when you have the earthquakes. And you see that actually most of this distance increase is not due to the earthquakes, it's really due to, to the opening, mm -hmm. opening of, of this dike. Um, these two, this distance here, is these other two islands, this one and this one. They become um, squeezed together. Um, this figure is in the same paper and is useful for something that I will show you later. You did uh, have some rate state with uh, Karim. Karim did it for you. So there will be some application of rate state uh, to earthquakes produced by dikes. Here I want just to show you. So generally when seismologists talk about rate state is about these two. So like you have like a sudden step change in stress due to the occurrence of a main shock. And then this causes, if you put this into the equations, this causes like a step in the seismicity rate and a fast decay, which uh, you can model with Omori decay. Did you talk about Omori decay? Like it is the number of earthquakes after a main shock that decreases. If you take the logarithm, it decreases like this. So basically you have pre the pre-earthquake seismicity rate, this big jump, it's a really high jump, and then seismicity basically erodes the stress that is caused by the main shock, and then you have this uh, decay, and then you go, and you go back to the previous value. Um, however, when you have a dike, you don't have anything sudden. I mean, the earthquakes, of course, are a sudden stress change, but the dike is not a sudden stress change. It's a, a very smooth stress change that you have in the rock. And this is like this, you know, you can, uh, you can go, like this is like tectonic stress change, for example, uh, stressing rate, let's say, tectonic stressing rate, which is that the slow uh, push or pull of the tectonic plates. And here you can see what happens if you, this is like a simplification of what occurs during a dike. It's not that you really have a different gradient like this, but you have something smoother, it's not a step like in the other one, right? So you have something smoother for a while that increases the stressing rate and then actually you go back to tectonic once the dike is over. And what you have in the seismicity, if you do that, you, you actually have a swarm. You have a swarm of earthquakes. This is what occurs. You don't have a main shock aftershock, you have a swarm of earthquakes. Your seismicity rate increases and then it goes to it increases smoothly and it goes to a new maximum, to a new seismicity rate and then eventually it will go back to the other thing. So you will have a swarm. A swarm, what is the difference between a swarm and a main shock aftershock sequence? Smaller. Okay, well, you say one thing, you say one thing. <laughs> like if a collection of smaller earthquakes, it's more degrees. 
So it doesn't need to be small, small because here they are magnitude to six. Huh? It doesn't need to be small. <laughs> I think there is no relation between the, I mean, there is no uh, magnitude change. They might, uh, any type of magnitude may appear and they are uh, closing number. I mean, they, they happen in large number within a short period of time. This is for swallow. As for aftershocks, there is one big, as you can see, the aftershock will be came this time. Yes, so this is a difference that you have. First of all, uh, you said actually two things. One thing is that uh, uh, there is no dominating earthquake. Yeah. So in a main shock after shock, you have a big one, and all the rest is actually quite smaller, yeah? yes. generally, because <laughs> I mean, there are exceptions. So today you can have weird sequences. In swarms, generally, you have several earthquakes of the same order of magnitude of the bigger one. And then you said another thing that is correct, that they are uh, not sorted according yeah. to first the largest, yeah. and then they occur. So the, the, the biggest earthquake does not need to occur at the beginning of the se sequence. It, it can occur later. Yes. It can occur later. Um, also, there, is a, there are other things. Uh, one other thing is that if you look at the map, not always, but swarms often show migrations. Mm -hmm. Like this is a very typical case where you show really that it goes, uh, it migrates. Um, exactly. Um, did I forget something? I think this is the main, the main things. Um, yeah. So uh, at volcanoes, you always observe swarms. You, all, you can also observe uh, uh, main shock after shock sequences, mm -hmm. it happens, but the regular observation is swarms. However, swarms not only occur at volcanoes, they also occur tectonically. Okay. So, and often, so basically what is behind is generally that you have a stasi that is smoother. You don't have like a sudden start, like a main shock creating a big stress change, but you have a smoother stress change. And this causes a, a smooth increase of seismicity rate and uh, also larger magnitudes occurring more or less where they want. Um, yes. So this was a map of the Coulomb stress change. It's just a map. I mean, there are better studies uh, that came later, but it, it's one, I think it was the first one showing it for a dike because it's different, the pattern, Coulomb stress change you did for falls. Yeah, so for, for a dike, basically, how would that look like? Let me go blackboard. Yeah. So like if you have um, a fault, you have a given pattern, you know, for Coulomb stress change, generally you have actually a very big increase at the tips, you know, because th this is where you expect to see a lot. And then depending on the fault, if it is curved or if it is rectilinear, you may have also concentration somewhere else. Um, a dike, since it is opening like this, um, and also I told you, this is also a typical behavior, like a crack will uh, um, also shrink in this direction when it opens, at least instantaneously. Then actually you can see why main faults, they occur like this and they go this way. You can look at this both vertically and in map view. So like vertically, this will be the gravel fault that we talked about, right? But you can also see it in map view. So earthquakes, uh, dikes, when they propagate, will cause a lot of seismicity in front of them. In then they are strike slip. If you look at it in map view, it's strike slip. If you look at in cross section and you are in front, then it's a normal fault. Okay. Um, so basically, Coulomb stress is high in this pattern because this is like a, around the dike, of course, 
and also kind of here, 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 and here. However, here there is like a cool um, observation that you don't have so much seismicity on one, you have almost everything on the other one, uh, so you have almost all the seismicity here and here, and not so much here and here. And now we will clarify this, why this is uh, occurring. Um, okay, but first of all, we can have a look at the reason why the dike stopped. How, uh, how can this be checked? So first of all, there are two main hypotheses that were brought forward to explain why the dike stopped so suddenly even if the supply of magma was still uh, pumping in and it was still pumping in so much that the dike became four times as thick as before uh, stopping, right? So when it stopped it was uh, one thickness and then it became four times this thickness. It means that it was not a lack of supply that made the dike stop. Some dikes stop because of lack of supply because they, they basically drain so much the magma chamber that the pressure at the magma chamber becomes equal to the pressure at the dike and then this slowly, slowly slows down and stops. Several of them do this, but... And then in this case you see the seismicity that slows down and, and it stops. But in this case it wasn't like this, it was actually kind of constant velocity and tuck, stop. Two hypotheses were brought forward. One was that the earthquake stopped the dike. This earthquake of magnitude 6 occurring stopped the dike. The other hypothesis was that the dikes, um, so we didn't really say it so much, but we know that they go laterally away from the volcano. You see it went laterally away. And you see that this is the bathymetry. On the left, you have the big uh, topography of the volcano that originated the dike. Since you have the, the load of the volcano, this will squeeze the tail of the dike and it will help the, so basically when you have a topography, it helps also the dikes are going away because you have more pressure at the tail of the dike than you have at the, at the tip of the dike. So they, therefore they go and go. But here, it happened that it found another volcano. It found the, actually it was the eastern, the northeastern flank of this volcano, submarine here. So this is the volcano but it had a topography and on the pathway of the dike this was the topography in front of this dike. So this can also help uh, stopping the dike. For example also the Bardabunga dike, actually we didn't even, we didn't talk about that a lot but when it propagated all that way, why did it stop to where it stopped? Probably people think it is really because of this reason, because it found that the, you remember that there was another volcano, Askia, mm -hmm. where Cambridge had all the stations around. So exactly when the topography started to rise, there the dike basically decided to stop. And there there was no other reason really, there was no earthquake, there was nothing. So the doubt is probably, also there you had this, uh, you know, slowing down, so it, it um, it could have been also the magma chamber, but the problem is the magma chamber also continued to supply magma. Anyway, we will talk about the Bardabunga that may be again, but it's in general it's a, it's a question why did it stop? And it's important to know, because if you understand why it stops, then you can also predict where other types will stop and where they will erupt, because they can come very far away, and you may want to know uh, in advance where is the likely position where they will stop and up. Okay, in this case, um, I'll show you how you can check, in principle, what is the real reason. So, okay, here you can see the cloud of seismicity going down, deeper and far away, and then the star is this uh, magnitude 6. Uh, the location of the magnitude 6 and the dike really stops there and actually you can see that it even goes a bit back you know the yellow comes so you have blue 
light blue, green, yellow, and then red in time, and the dike actually goes back a little bit. Why does it go back? Um, okay, so this shows a model where you have only topography, there is no fault to interact with the dike. There is only topography and uh, one assumes, uh, one can assume that there is like a crack that is fed from the magma chamber and you have the pressure of the volcano and also the pressure of, of the other bathymetry here. So you have both. And then you supply magma to this thing. You supply magma, you supply magma, and then you see how the shape, uh, you use maybe this boundary element, you know, that I showed you. you. You say, I increase the mass into this crack and I see where it can reach, uh, where it can reach. And basically from this model one can see that if you supply more magma, first the dike advances and advances, and then it actually really stops due to this bathymetry. It becomes fatter, 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 fatter without really advancing so much. Then it advances, uh, so it becomes even more fat, advances a little bit, advances a little bit, and then at some point, before becoming um, as fat as possible, so I mean, it starts to overcome the topography uh, before it reached the final volume. So therefore the topography really could have stopped it if it had had less magma. But in this case it was not the reason. And then, um, in this case, for this model, there is also a fault. Uh, there is actually not also a fault, but only a fault in this, in this model here. So basically in, this, in the first model, there is a topography and nothing else. In this one, there is a dike without any topography, without any topography, but with a fault. So what happens? The dike advances, the fault is here. Um, so how, actually I didn't show you how we know that there was a fault. Uh, I need to show you a map um, that actually comes later in the slides. I need to put it earlier. This is the seismicity before the dike, in the three years preceding the dike. And you can see that there is a very big fault actually here, active, very active. And the most uh, focal mechanisms are strike slip. They are normal faulting here in this region, but then they are strike slip again. So actually they are normal faulting close to the islands. Maybe there the stress is a bit flipped because also you have the big islands. Anyway, a slightly different stress environment here. But mostly, even here you have also strike slip. Mostly slight strike slip and this kind of motion. It's important, what kind of motion. So this fault is active and actually it goes like this. Okay? The dial is traveling. Um, can you predict what happens mechanically? Like you have this situation, you have an opening fracture advancing <laughs> and then meeting a fault that can slip only in this sense. I think it will cause this way. It will cause an earthquake here, this way, okay? So basically a slip in this yeah. direction, yeah. right? And what uh, will happen here? Also here the fault wanted to slip in this direction. Because it is dropped from the right yeah. What will happen here? Will there be an earthquake or what will yeah. there be? There will be an earthquake, but the magma will tend to flow this way, maybe. Uh, other, other, other options? Yeah, it's a weird situation, huh? Like you have a forcing in the opposite way as the fault actually wants to move or has been loaded to move. The fault is loaded to move in a given direction and the dike will come and push in the opposite direction. So what will happen to this fault? The dike 
will push away. The knife will push it in the opposite direction. So if you are there sitting on this fault, what will you observe in the next days? And will you have an increased likelihood of earthquakes or a decreased likelihood of earthquakes on that fault? It will decrease because it the stress decrease. in zone, it is opposing the stress. This it will decrease. It, it will decrease. decrease. Yes. In this direction. Because it is forced to, so basically it was loaded in one direction and then the cycle loads it in the other direction. So basically it deletes some of yeah. the loading. Yeah. Okay? So, and this is actually what happened. This part slipped and this part, look at the map. This part. This is the seismic before the earthquake, three years before, entire three years. This is the seismicity ten years after the earthquake, the dike, sorry. So you can see it completely changed the behavior of the fault. There is no earthquake whatsoever in that region <laughs> anymore for ten years. Before it was super active. You see the comparison? So the dike, this is the dike, mostly it's seismicity of the dike. Here something continued, here also something happened, here you also have something, you know, the two patterns, but here for 10 years, nothing. Crazy, huh? <laughs> so this is called, the people have called it like a stress shadow when this happens, okay? So it basically it's a huge stress shadow that the dike uh, imparted on just one portion of the fault, while the other portion slipped and slipped. Okay, so let's go back to the reason why the dike stopped. Um, so this is more or less, you know, is one possible model of the shape of the dike if you only have the fault. So the dike is here, it advances, it touches the fault, then here it's not shown, but you also have slip on the fault. And then the dike starts to fatten and fatten and fatten, but it's not going to advance. Because the, the, the increased pressure basically helps the dike to slip and become fatter at the tip, but it's not helping to penetrate because it's not allowed by the fault moving. However, if you look at the shape of the dike, we didn't talk about this yet, but uh, so we have we have seen that dikes create uh, uh, like a cloud of seismicity moving. And if you plot it, um, this is distance and this is time. You see that this airway, they go like this. Actually, there is such a figure also somewhere. Maybe this one, you can see it's not the best, but you can see how it looks like. This is distance and this is time. And you can see it moves, uh, it propagates, but not only it propagates, it also, you have seismicity only like in a band. You know what I mean to say? It's not that you activate an area and then this area will continue to have earthquakes. It will have earthquakes only while the tip passes. And once the tip has passed, it will be quiet. So, in order to have this, actually, the only way is that you kind of push, you extend, but then also you shrink, because it, when you shrink, then you, uh, basically, you the distress, the, the I don't know how to say, you... Decreasing the stress. Yeah, you decrease the stress, and then you remove the seismicity, okay? So this is important, and if you have this shape, so here at the back, the dike continues to thicken, so there is no, 
there is no option for the seismicity to actually um, decrease at the tail because everything is becoming fatter and fatter. You should see seismicity everywhere. Actually, this is true only for the propagation phase because actually, uh, yeah, I was wrong in pointing out this because it's actually this. It's actually this because this is during the propagation phase that you see this. And here you see, if you don't put any topography at the back, uh, the crack will just become bigger also at the tail. It will not shrink. Only if you put the topography at the back, then during the propagation phase, you have this crack that is going to actually move as a, as a crack and propagate like the gelatin ones. You know, like the gelatin ones would cause something like this because they really move and they close the tail. So basically the final message of this study was the fault definitely was the played the major role in stopping the dike, in arresting the dike. However, you need to also account for the topography to have um, a balanced model that can explain all observations. You know, the, if you don't put the topography and the bathymetry, if you don't put all the stresses where they are, so to say, so at the tip you have the stress due to the fault slipping that acts on the dike, the dike acts on the fault, the bathymetry and topography acts on the dike too, everything is connected. And if you want to have uh, a model for the mechanics of everything and also the deformation and everything, how everything is related to, to the rest, you need to put all the, the factors and then you have a complete model. Okay, let's go and have a look at these uh, earthquakes and focal mechanisms. Here you can see that there are also focal mechanisms. There is a good catalog for this intrusion. Um, due to the fact that in Japan the monitoring is uh, incredible. Okay, so now we'll have a look at the focal mechanisms pre-diking and post-diking because this is also teaches us some of the mechanics of the of what you can you can see in volcanoes okay so here basically you have all the mechanisms that were uh, before the dike uh, they are colored according to mechanism so the green ones and the brown ones here they are basically all strike slip and the pink, the purple are uh, normal folding and they are all here. These are two other diagrams where you can read how the focal mechanisms are. The, uh, the three balls are the p-axis, t-axis, v-axis. Are you familiar with that? So the, the pressure axis, tension axis, and the um, neutral axis. So what do you observe if you look at those three balls? Um, okay, I can help you a little bit. Do you see one of the three that is uh, very clear, very dominant, very clear? The T-axis. The T-axis is very clear because it's uh, all earthquakes cluster to say that you have actually a dominant extension in this direction. P-axis is basically everything consistent with the T-axis. You see, they are everywhere perpendicular to that location, everywhere. So um, the dominant is the T. This means that the tectonics is dominated by extension and that uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are probably similar, similar size, because the faults can decide which one they take. They, however, all take the sigma 3. They all uh, use uh, the extensional axis as sigma 3 and they cannot decide which one of the other two to take. It means they must be relatively similar. Okay, then let's have a look at the other diagram. The other diagram shows a strike uh, dip and rake. Basically, you, from the diagram, you see how the faults are oriented, and you can see that the strike is mainly, well, you can see, first of all, here, from the rake, here you can read that there are very few 
trust earthquakes. All of them are either strike slip, which are zero and man, man, minus 180, or also 180. And some of them are normal faulting, which is minus 90. Minus 90 is normal faulting. This and this and this are strike slip, and this would be trust. So trust earthquakes, you don't have any. Fine, this is very consistent with extensional tectonics. Um, okay, let's have a look at what happens after the dike. I'll, sh I'll show you one after the other several times. So if you look at the three balls, um, what did the change? It is a bit rotated. So it is still uh, tensional, yeah. still tensional, but a bit rotated. It's not the same. It's, oops. Before it was more east-west, and now it's uh, now it's northeast southwest. Um, and also, you can see that it is basically the tensional axis is exactly perpendicular to the dike. Can you see that? So basically, the dike. Yeah. 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 So. This is um, now dominating. The dike is dominating the, the, how the dike was um, in place. The, the stress field of the dike is dominating over the tectonic stress field because it's uh, actually inducing the faults to break in a different direction. Again, the p-axis is a bit weird because it has a pattern. And, uh, but uh, anyway, and here we can see some things in this map here. So the orange ones are the normal faulting. So you see here? Where are the orange? They are a tiny bit here and here. This is the strike of the dike, the dashed line. So basically the normal faulting are exactly, have exactly the strike of the dike. And actually if you look at their depth, it's in this other diagram, it's a bad diagram because focal mechanisms, often the locations, they are inverted with the focal mechanism sometimes. So it's one of the unknown of the inversion. But it's a, you see, it's like a grid search. So it's not, um, so the locations are not you know, very precise. It's just a grid search. But all the orange earthquakes are shallow. So basically, this means that the orange ones are the normal faulting at the, at the, on top of the dike, the normal faulting, because they have the same strike and uh, they are um, shallow and they have the same strike of the dike. Why? The oblique mechanism, you have strike slip and oblique. Um, so the, you have strike slip. Strike slip will be those that I showed you in the diagram before. So basically the dike is there. It will have normal faulting on top and strike slip in front and also at the back. But then you will have everything in between. These are the oblique. So you will have this and you will have also this. If you are here, it's strike slip. If you are here, it's normal faulting. If you are here, you are something in between. These are oblique. They have some. Uh, the they component. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And these are the. Oh, my song. Later. No. <laughs> Dante. Sto facendo lezione e non ti posso rispondere, mi devi chiamare dopo le 5 e mezza. Ok. Mi il telefono? No. Dopo le 5 e mezza. È super fun. Ok. <coughs> yes, so this is it, more or less. This, we can skip. So this is like a, a bit of an illustration of how all these folds may look like all around. It looks like this uh, Diabolo that you swing. 
you know, they are all, uh, yeah, and the focal mechanisms that you expect. And then another cool observation. I think this is quite cool. So, what happens if we divide the earthquake by their uh, dominant focal mechanism? And we look at the statistics. So you have had some Gutenberg, uh, you know what it is, right? So that we know that the frequency magnitude relation of the earthquakes, if you have enough of them, I mean there are a lot of assumptions, if you have a variety of situations, if you have a big catalog, you need to have many earthquakes, they show a power law distribution. Um, Did they, uh, did they show you by any chance a paper by a guy, Sean Lemmer et al, that shows that uh, normal faulting, strike sleep and thrust earthquake actually they have a slightly different B value uh, among each other. So basically if you take strike sleep, if you, so this guy, uh, I can put the paper into your things. Uh, this guy showed, the, and co-author showed, that if you take uh, the catalog of Japan or the catalog of California, that are very, very good catalogs, and you collect the earthquakes by rake, so you take basically all the strike slip, and then you move 10 degrees by 10 degrees in rake, and you arrive at normal faulting, then you move, and you arrive also at uh, thrust, and you calculate the B value separately for these categories, you find that the strike slip have really one. And you find that normal faulting have something larger than one. They have, uh, I don't know, 1.1 or 1.2. Now I can't remember the number, but a bit more. And the thrust faulting have a bit less, 0 0.9. And they explain this by, uh, so there are two main explanations, or one main, Actually, one main explanation is the level of stress. Like uh, compressional tectonics has generally higher level of stress because it takes a uh, bigger stress to break into a thrust mechanism. You need to push much more, while it takes uh, less stress to pull and create a normal faulting. This is why you have um, uh, higher and lower B, B values because if you don't if you don't have so much stress and you break, it means that you pull, 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 pull and break. Pull, pull, pull and break. And tend to break actually a bit earlier. It means you cannot grow so many larger quicks. You grow more of the small in proportion, more of the small and less of the big large. The opposite is true when you push and push, because push, 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 you cannot break, you cannot break, push, 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 ta. And when you do, it's a lot of energy, and then you, you go. This is what probably is behind this. So now it made sense to check in this case, since the catalog was good. And uh, there are no trust, so one cannot investigate those, but one can separate the strike slip and the, and the normal faulting, predominantly normal faulting. And one can see an interesting thing. The, what do you see for the strike slip? The strike slip have an almost perfect Gutenberg, even down to the biggest magnitude. There is not even, you know, very often the biggest earthquake doesn't really fit with the line. It's uh, actually generally lower. Uh, it depends. But in general, the biggest earthquake is somewhere, somewhat off. Here, you have it kind of really perfect. And what about the normal faulting? So the normal faulting, actually, if you look at uh, the the magnitude range, not the largest, but the magnitude range between 5 and 3.5 or 4, it's actually very similar to the other one. There is no difference. Um, so probably the magnitude of completeness is around 4. You know, magnitude of completeness is the magnitude about which you are sure that you basically have them all. You didn't miss any earthquakes. Uh, but the pattern changes 
uh, for the largest magnitudes, not only the, the biggest one, but also here and here. You, basically, it seems that you are lacking some earthquakes. So the B value is the same. If you estimate it with a method that is called the uh, slope stability or B stability method, basically the, this method starts from here and uh, it, uh, you change the slope, you change the slope until when, if you, so basically you start from here, you change the slope and then you at some point find a slope that is good for a while. This is called uh, a B stability method, something like this, and uh, it's one possible method because another method is to find the best slope that uh, explains also here the biggest magnitude. If you wanted to do that, then you would get something like this uh, with a higher B value. So what happens here? Why, why are they lacking there? And the paper suggests three hypotheses. One hypothesis is stress level, that uh, for the same reason you cannot grow larger earthquakes. But then there is uh, other two hypotheses. One is the rheology. Uh, well, let's say one is geometry. Why geometry? Because since the door set to soil occur at the top of the dike, there is a limited thickness of that layer. So the dike is below, and you have the normal faulting. They cannot be super large because there is no space. Even if you break the entire graben at once above so the dike, yeah, you, you get to a magnitude that is probably around 5.5. .5. You, you, you can't reach the, the biggest magnitude. You don't have any space to do. And this actually is uh, quite interesting. And it happens a lot in mines. So if you go and measure the magnitude of earthquakes in mines, the uh, mining environment has uh, very often layers and uh, earthquakes can occur in the strongest layers while they don't occur so much in the weakest layers. And the strongest layers in mines, they are particular environments, they have a fixed uh, width, these layers. And all the earthquakes are the same magnitude, you know, because they break into, or they can be smaller but not bigger than a given number. And then in mines you have a Gutenberg Richter, they go like this, like this. So you have a lot of breaking in the slope because you have different sets of earthquakes occurring in different areas and volumes, obeying to the geometry, also stress of course, but obeying also very strongly to geometry. So this is one reason, but it's also not the only reason, potential reason, there is another reason, which is if earthquakes occur in the shallowest layers, like the first uh, two, three kilometers, for example, then also rheology may be a factor, because the rheology of the shallowest layers is not as strong as the rheology of the deepest layers. And so again, you cannot grow large magnitude if you have a very weak rheology, if you have sediments. You are going to probably have a lot of smaller ones rather than a big one. And so, uh, there are um, several messages here. One message is not only calculate the values, but check whether Gutenberg Richter is a good model. Are they really distributed according to a power law? On the left, yes. On the right, they are not. Gutenberg Richter is not a good model for those ones. Only in a restricted magnitude range, Gutenberg Richter is a good model. For the rest, it's not a good model. And then you need to find maybe an explanation. If one is less careful, one say, okay, there I have a B value 1.4, you know, for the other type. But actually, if you look a bit carefully, this is not the case. The B value is really similar to the other ones. What changes is that you have a lack of big ones. Um, in other cases, you may have a lack of small ones. Um, so you, it's a just a message to try to go a bit deeper into the analysis than just uh, superficially looking at this. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at focal mechanisms due to volcanoes in general. In this figure, it's shown vertical CLBDs. Vertical CLBDs are considered like uh, weird earthquakes. They do occur in mines, again, CRBD, have you, are you familiar with CRBD? No? 
Okay, so then next we need to actually, then I'll go to another slide that it comes later, this one. Um, okay, here we have a representation of the moment tensor. So you know moment tensor uh, is a matrix, it is 3 by 3, actually this is the classical figure that you probably have seen um, where you have uh, the components illustrated also in terms of uh, these arrows like you have for example um, uh, motion so the surface perpendicular to x in x direction then you have m11 and so on um, if you decompose the moment sensor, did you did you have a uh, did you have a, a check on the decomposition of moment tensor? So basically, you can basically what people do in uh, tectonic environments, they assume that the earthquake is going to be double coupled. This you probably have discussed, and then you have uh, solutions that are actually. didn't put the slides, but now we are starting again. So um, this is the strike slip, or yes, and here is like normal. You can also have uh, thrust. Actually, this is thrust. <laughs> okay. These are double couple, double couple earthquakes, uh, and the representation in the moment time. So, so. Do you know if I plot like one of those pitch ball? Can you tell me the numbers or uh, the opposite way around? Are you able to do this? So do you know why the, for example, this one? So can you pass from this to this yes. re relatively easily? Yeah. Okay. That's M, M12 and M21. That means uh, it shows. Yeah. M1 to means uh, one along uh, y. The, uh, the first one shows the direction of the pulse, and M2 the arm. The arm and the so pulse. okay, let's let's uh, do it. So let's suppose we have this one. <coughs> So this one is, uh, actually one has to remember that x is always in north direction, right? X is, uh, so generally the, the one axis is like this, x, and then you have uh, uh, z is like a that, or up, I can't remember. Z is down, yeah. or up. It's just down, down is positive. Down is positive, so let's put it like this, and then this would be y, let's say. So um, here you have a movement that is, and also one has always to remember that it is the lower hemisphere projection. So actually in this case we have that the, that the surface uh, against y goes in minus x direction. So basically, this brings uh, the face against y goes in minus x direction. It brings a minus one here, right? Something like this. And in fact, you have minus one over square root of two, and then two ones. And it needs to be symmetric, so you have also this. So it's easy. Trace is uh, zero, which is good for. Uh, double couple, trace needs to be zero, and this is the motion. While if you have the other one, you saw the one at the side, then you have uh, x in x direction. So you put an y, because you go always from the, so basically you have the, the black is out, and the white is in, okay? From the white to the black. To remember is go to the dark side. <laughs> this is how you remember to go in the correct direction. 
So basically you can see that the x direction goes out, so you put a number 1, positive, and the y direction goes in, and you put minus 1, okay? Okay, this is just to make sure that uh, more or less this is understood. Uh, here there are also non-double couple components. Non-double couple components are important for volcanic environment. We mentioned this shortly the, the other day, yesterday, I think. Uh, the first, first very easy is the uh, one at the top. So the, the explosive or implosive uh, kind of source, which is like isotropic. All arrivals are equal in all directions. So you just move like this everywhere, or like this. Generally, what uh, the, the composition is done by removing this. This is easy by remo to remove because you just calculate the trace and you remove one third of the trace from the diagonal, and then uh, you will have one tensor which has a uh, uh, isotropic. Uh, component and one other tensor that has a trace equal to zero, okay? So if you, from any moment tensor, you put random numbers into the moment tensor, you calculate the trace and you do a tensor that has, is equal to itself minus another tensor that has one third of the trace, one third of the trace, one third of the trace. Then you end up having, uh, so this one you take it apart, and the other one will have uh, zero trace. So it will be not yet double couple, but it will be zero trace. So you remove the one thing. So you remove also one uh, uh, parameter, because moment tensor is symmetric, so you have six independent components. If you remove isotropic, then you are left with five. Okay. Then you can uh, actually, uh, it, you run into a problem. The next step. So this is easy and unique. First, this, this the composition is unique. There is only one way to do it. Now, next uh, is difficult because you don't know actually. So there are assumptions for the next decomposition. The next decomposition generally tries to maximize double couple. And uh, there, there are assumptions. You can like. Uh, Generally, it's like a maximization of the double couple for tectonic uh, purposes. But what happens in volcanic environment, okay, then if you do this, actually, you can always express the next part as a sum of a uh, double couple and uh, what you find in the bottom. What you find in the bottom, you see that it has zero trace, but it is everything in the diagonal. This is called the CLBD, which means Compensated Linear Vector Dipole. It's just a name. What is the physical meaning of this Compensated Linear Vector Dipole? Uh, it is kind of a debated thing, because in uh, tectonics it is thought not to have any significance whatsoever. It is thought to arise only because you have errors. You have errors because you have noise, you have faults that are not really rectilinear, but they are a bit curved. And then basically you have some, uh, some uh, deviation from a perfect pattern of a beautiful double couple. And this uh, component is actually expressing, it's just a mathematical expression of the error that you actually have in your data. However, now I will show you that volcanic earthquakes have these things all the time. All the time, not all the time, but often. And actually they are quite big. Now I will show you a, for a graph. This graph here. These are different uh, cases. So this one is, was one in, uh, in, uh, in the US. It's uh, old, so you can still see how it was done at the time by um, on the stereographic uh, surface to report the arrivals plus and minus. This is like uh, it was done before. Now it's a different thing. Now you basically do a waveform 
uh, fitting either in the time domain or in the frequency domain there are different codes and they actually use the entire waveform or a bit of the waveform they don't just use the first arrival the modern method to invert for focal mechanisms but you can see so these are two I think that they are Japanese one and you can see it's very hard to fit a double couple here there is no double couple here some of them look like a double couple. This is Miyakejima again. Have a look, these are the earthquakes, um, the biggest ones. These are magnitude 6 earthquakes, some of them. I mean, they are quite big. And uh, the ball close to, close to the focal mechanism is the isotropic. So it's huge isotropic. And some of them uh, are double couple plus isotropic, but some of them are not. Look at this one. Look at this one, look at this one. They are far from being isotropic, from being double coupled. There is an a deviation. Look at this, it's still Miyakejima, and these actually are the earthquakes that occurred. It's the same time period, they occurred at the caldera. The caldera was collapsing during the dark. Yeah, it's like similar to implosions we will discuss. What is this? This is Raphael <laughs> again. These are some of the focal mechanisms uh, for um, not the main dike of the sequence, one of the following dikes. Do you know Manalo Belacciu? He's, uh, it was, I think. Yeah, Manalo. He, <laughs> he I know Professor Yerko. Ah, okay. He's a volcanologist. Yeah, so this Manalo guy first was in Addis at the university, but then he went to do his PhD in the US. And uh, he worked at the earthquakes and he also inverted the focal mechanisms for the diking sequence. And this is his result. So, what I'm the first message of this map, uh, this case is Iceland. The first message of this map is. There is quite a lot of non-double couple here, so we need to deal with it. We cannot just say it's error. Error can be in tectonic environments, but here I don't think so. It's too big to be just a, a noise in the data. Also because some of these earthquakes are really large, and therefore you have a good focal mechanism. It's not that they are bad. Okay, we can start from the vertical ones, vertical CLVD. Vertical CLVD can be Vertical CLVD, let's put blackboard. Can be two patterns. It's called the fry bed. Can be like this. Or it can be like this. Okay, and it is basically in map view, you can think of it, so it has a physical, it may have a physical meaning in volcanoes. In map view, it's like a crack with a constant volume, so it's not a, a crack that is uh, expanding, because a crack that is expanding will actually expand in all directions. But if you take volume constant and you pull the crack or push it or squeeze it, then this is the pattern. So basically this is a crack that is being pulled because you have all inward motion from the outside. And here you have like this. And this is the opposite. Like you squeeze, squeeze it. it. You squeeze it and then it goes this way. Okay, you can understand that while this source in seismology for tectonic areas has absolutely no physical correspondence in a volcano, it can. In particular, look at the figure in the this one. So this one at the Miyakejima, you have a caldera collapse. Um, I mean, it's not that easy, but when you have uh, the piston of the caldera pushing into the caldera because it's collapsing, you have uh, a motion that goes like this, but then you also have the magma that is uh, in the magma chamber that will push at the side. So actually, this is quite uh, 
physically consistent that you may have this, uh, this part, right? And why constant volume? Because you are not changing the volume while you are doing this, you know? You push and then it needs to go this way. You are not uh, changing the volume so much. So actually I think it's much more difficult to understand the isotropic source rather than the CLVD. The CLVD makes sense. Let's have a look at the, in the upper right part was also, a, I think, a magma chamber losing magma or a collapse. And you can see, no, that was an inflation. It was a magma chamber that was being fed from below. And it was going like this, the, the earthquakes. Um, even if you are feeding the magma chamber, in the time frame that you have the earthquake, it's not that you are going to have a big volume change, eh? because earthquakes occur really fast, and the flow takes time. So it's more the type of motion. If you slip some fault at the top, uh, then it will induce this kind of behavior, and then it needs to, to pull also at the side, because during that time, it's an elastic thing. You have to compensate, you know? This is why it's called the compensated linear vector dipole, because this name compensated means that you actually compensate for one motion by bringing, so it's a constant volume thing. If we look at the um, AFAR, they are also like, they look like a, you know, it's actually a light propagating, and you ca can kind of see in the earthquake some normal faulting in them, you know? It makes sense. Like the, the pattern looks, it's not like a, something like this. It's actually something more like this. I don't know how to plot it. So it, it looks like a combination of a normal faulting plus something that closes. So probably, I, so my interpretation, it's really like it's just an interpretation now, is that you have the magma chamber that is uh, feeding this dike and is collapsing. And every time you have an earthquake, the, actually the, the, um, it can be the gravel faulting or it can be below, below the dike also with the same focal mechanism but also you are depriving the magma chamber of some magma by the earthquake, you are actually pushing the magma chamber, squeezing it, and at the same time you have the normal faulting. So this may be an interpretation. Also, you can see that the two, earth, two earthquakes that are southernmost, they are far away from the magma chamber, they have actually a different mechanism. They are still kind of normal, but a bit strike slip. <laughs> And they have a different pattern, which is not like this, but is actually like this, um, which is very common in the Miyakejima area, far away from the caldera, but closer to the dike, and also close to the number eight, which was a dike. Why would you have, so this is actually the same as this. You just take the ball and you bring it like this. It's like a basketball ball, right? You turn it this way, and then you have this pattern. For example, then here, like this. Then this would be like this, just turned 90 degrees. So um, if you have a dike and some faulting, you can have the faulting. For example, a strike slip earthquake at the tip of the dike, this will slip like this. And then the dike will have a reaction. The reaction will be to probably kind of open and, and uh, or, uh, open and squeeze in this direction because it's compensated again. Okay, so just the message is these earthquakes. Um, so this is my interpretation. I, there is no paper to say this. Um, I always wanted to write it, but uh, it's still not written. Um, also with some calculation supporting it, it's actually not uh, difficult. Um, but I think it makes sense that these earthquakes, I mean, they are too large to be just noise, and there is a pattern, like here there is a dike, here there is a dike, and they definitely look the same. Here there is something collapsing, here there is something collapsing, and they look the same. Here there is something inflating and they look opposite. So, and if you look 
uh, the point is that um, there are not so many studies with the full moment tensor inversion. It's called the full moment tensor when you recover all the components and not only double couple. Uh, Intertonically, it doesn't make much sense to recover all of them. Generally, people have uh, four components, which are those needed to have a double couple, the four independent numbers, because you have uh, zero isotropic, and also you constrain to be if a double couple, then you remove also uh, the CLPD, or you keep the CLPD alive, and then you, you treat it as a, an error, you know. But in volcanic areas, it may make sense if you have enough stations, you need to have a very good coverage to actually invert for the full moment tensor. Um, because this can, can bring you some understanding. For example, if you find that the focal mechanism, I mean, if this is really demonstrated, and then there is also a paper, not only just my interpretation, that shows that really every time you have a dike, you, you see this pattern, and you, every time you see a map um, collapse, you see that pattern, and so on, then you can also use it to make inferences in cases where you don't have any much monitoring, because if the earthquakes are big enough, you can even use global stations if they are about 5 or 4.5, 5. You can use global stations for a full moment tensor inversions. And then you can figure out actually what is going on. Is it tectonic or is it volcanic? Already, like you said, having a presence of very big isotropic or very big CLPD. Here I'm talking about at least 30% CLPD then you may have an indication, okay, there, must, there may be some fluids, some, some fluids, because it's fluids, actually what is it? It's fluids reacting to some tectonic slip. Or in, uh, I didn't put, but I think in uh, industrial activities you see similar things, where you inject water, or you extract water, then you have earthquakes, I think you see very similar things. Okay, and then I wanted to show you these other slides that are, so um, you see these are, look at this, if you saw this, what would you interpret? You saw, they ask you, you know, they contact you from this remote place in the Pacific, they call you because you are in some observatory and they ask you, I have this in my, in my submarine island, what is happening? It's, it's, it's an interpretation, it's probably like a, some sort of collapse and the other earthquakes, what can they be? As a dark. It could be like a dark brain in the chamber and collapse in the chamber, you see, because they go. What would you ask them to do? What would you ask them to plot for you better to understand so, whether it can be a dark? The migration of good time. Yeah, you can put time. time. You can put time. And, and then you see what happens. Is, the, is it really like a migrating? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. If it is also migrating, you need to ask them like uh, how long it took for the for the other poles, and then to divide that time in four or five portions, and to see if they really migrate or not. Yeah, this could be an idea. Um, you know, and then... Or maybe a fault near the volcano. It could be. So actually, uh, you could try to get a focal mechanism also for the other ones. Um, there are methods to do that. There are, uh, so it depends what the magnitude is. You know, if, you, if they are too small, you are not able to, to do, but if you are a clever seismologist, you may find tricks. So you can try to stack them up. You can try to, you can even try to put a source that you think is uh, potentially feasible and you simulate it forward. You know, and then see if the waveforms that you get are similar to to what is said to the synthetic. For example, because if you know, if you you can check, I suspect this can be like a, another type of CLVD, or they can be normal faulting. 
I can simulate them and see if the waveforms are similar, the arrivals are similar. You can use tricks. This. You see these are uh, up or down. They are many of these vertical CRBTs. And she really observed this, uh, this person who did this earthquake, this uh, paper, she really observed that uh, all of them were at volcanoes or mines. It was, uh, I mean, she looked at the global catalog of moment answer and she express, expressively looked at those that were fitting a vertical CLBD, which is this. And then she looked uh, where they were and they were all at a, either a volcano or a mine. So either it was a mine collapse or a, or a magma chamber acting in one way or the other. Yeah. Um, okay, so much for this. Hmm, 10 minutes. Actually, I wanted to show you, since it is, you have questions. No questions. Um, yeah. you, um, I don't understand uh, why in the volcano we uh, not uh, assign the double couple, but in the moment they saw the, the sum of uh, diamond term equals zero. In volcano, why it equals zero? Yeah, in the moment they saw the sum of um, diamond term equals zero. Okay, so. Uh, good that you asked. So actually I didn't talk a lot about this. So what happens if you have isotropic source? So sum is not equal to zero. What happens? Because actually here there are cases where we have. What I think, again my interpretation, my think, is that in this case you have uh, gas in the fluid. Because for example, so this uh, could be proved actually. It could be proved by looking at shallow earthquakes or, or a deeper earthquakes and like really doing it very nicely and carefully. Like if you look at shallow earthquake in areas where you know that there is a lot of gas, for example, a caldera with a lot of hydrothermal activity, uh, something like this, where you see a lot of the gas in, then you know that you have gas. And if the earthquakes are shallow, they may have hilly gas uh, nearby. Then if you have this, you have an earthquake then actually you may have an instantaneous volume change because you compress. You compress and you expand. It's about the volume change. It's not so much about the mass. Even if the mass is very small and the mass change is zero because you, if you have gas, you are able to create a delta V. I think this is one uh, the potential reason why you may have isotropic source. Yeah. At least it's the only thing I can think. Because in order to have really like a volume change, instantaneous volume change, you need to have something that can shrink volumetrically or expand volumetrically. And the only thing I can yeah, think in the time frame, consider also one thing, that when you do moment tensor inversion, you filter the earthquakes in a band pass filter that is uh, you need to get rid of the very high frequencies because otherwise you are going to, to model tiny details that is not what you are interested in. And you need to also filter the super long ones because uh, they, then you get too much stuff into, into them that you don't want to see. So now I can tell you exactly what these filters are, but I think uh, they go, you know, you take in things that are from several times of seconds, like. 20, 30 seconds uh, up to two minutes. This is what you actually keep in terms of frequencies or periods. This means that actually the very, very high frequencies you get rid of, and therefore some change in the source that can take a little bit of time, up to one minute, is going to be in there. While things that take one second are not going to be in there, you know, uh, because this is the filter. Um, yeah, anyway, I think it's a very, very interesting topic, this uh, moment answer. Um, more questions? Otherwise, like the very last thing, I want to show you a movie because we don't have time to actually start another 
I found a good web page with the volcanic movies. There was an image sent. What do you want to see? Uh, Lahar, a pyroclastic flow. It will introduce a little bit to the topics of next week. We will again talk about the. We will talk next week. We will talk about the formation. We will talk um, about magma chambers. We will talk about uh, triggering of earthquakes and volcanoes together. So, like uh, an earthquake can trigger a volcano, or these kind of things. We will talk about uh, more analog experiments, and not the gelatin, other types that can tell us some of the physics of stuff. Um, yeah, let's have a look at the pyroclastic flow. I have not. Uh, Pyroclastic flows are one of the most deadly of volcanic hazards. They are rapidly moving avalanches of hot rock, dust and gas that flow down the sides of a volcano and into surrounding valleys. They can climb up and over ridges and high ground. They are dangerous because they flow much faster than a person can run and often faster than a car. So for those in their path, there's little chance of escape. What makes them especially lethal and devastating is that they're extremely hot. During the day they appear grey and ashy, but at night they can be seen glowing red hot. They destroy and burn anything in their way. Death or severe injury is certain for those caught by a pyroclastic flow. There are two main ways pyroclastic flows may fall. Sometimes a volcano explodes and forms a fountain of hot pulverized rock and gas that first rapidly rises into the sky and then falls back, forming pyroclastic flows which race down the sides of the volcano. Other times, instead of an explosion, sticky lava oozes out of the volcano and piles up around the summit. Pyroclastic flows can then form by parts of the lava collapsing. Pyroclastic flows normally move down valleys. Extremely hot, fast moving, billowing clouds form above them, which can spill out of valleys. This means that even people on high ground are not safe. Pyroclastic flows normally travel to distances of 5 to 10 kilometers from the volcano summit, but in the biggest eruptions, they reach much more than 20 kilometers. Volcanoes that haven't erupted for many decades or even centuries may appear peaceful. But when they awaken, the eruptions are often very large and explosive. Scientists can detect that a volcano is reawakening and are able to provide some warning and advice to evacuate, which is the only protection from pyroclastic flows. This, um, I will show, I will send you the, the link to these movies because they are good movies. They are uh, kind of done by scientists with the purpose of instructing people and there are also many in other languages, not so many languages, it's like Indonesian, there are a lot of movies in Indonesian, uh, in Italian, in Spanish and it's probably a good idea to keep uh, kind of translating them because uh, it's useful to, to instruct people, even people that are not from countries where you have a lot of volcanoes but you know, like people may be tourists, even German people, they have no volcanoes, you know, but they go, they travel and then you don't want them to go to Indonesia and not to know the things because they will, they will um, uh, be an obstacle to, to the local authorities. They will need to fish them, you know, and uh, rather than spend the money and resources to actually keep other people safe. So it's actually very important to keep also tourists well informed. Okay, so um, more questions? I need to give you the, yeah. 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 I was going to ask you. Yes. So far I gave you like the first two, two but first, I, yeah. I, yesterday and today I need to give you now, right?
meantime, while it, uh, we can look at Alahar, which is the other thing that is super dangerous. The major danger on many volcanoes comes from floods of water mixed with volcanic debris. These floods are called Lahars. Lahars are more destructive than a normal flood because they contain large amounts of rock, ash, mud and debris. Boulders swept along by the Laha can sometimes be the size of a car. They can form very quickly and flow down the volcano into the surrounding valleys often at high speeds. Several Lahars often occur in quick succession. Lahars are a major cause of death in volcanic eruptions. They can travel great distances, many kilometers or even many tens of kilometers. So communities far from the volcano can still be in great danger. There are many causes of lahars. A very common cause is if there's heavy rain. An eruption can cover the sides of a volcano with loose rocks and ash. Vegetation and soil, which normally absorbs the rain and prevents floods, can be destroyed by the eruption, adding to the problem. When it rains heavily, rock, ash and debris are easily swept into the water, forming lahars. The rocks and debris give the laha extra destructive energy and often the flows move much faster than someone can run. Some volcanoes are covered in glaciers and ice or snow. Eruptions of hot rocks can melt the ice or snow rapidly to form bursts of huge volumes of water that form lahars. Lahars can occur at any time during a volcanic eruption, but they can also happen many years afterwards. Fortunately, there can be warnings given about Lahars. If heavy rain is forecast, then the chances of a Lahar increases. For those places threatened, evacuation is the only option. If there's not enough time to evacuate, then people can protect themselves by immediately leaving valleys and going to high ground. Hiding in buildings is not safe, as large Lahars can destroy buildings and flow into them. But the upper floors of a strong building may offer some protection if there's no alternative. Okay, finish. Okay, excellent. So, your participation yeah. it, it was fun yeah, you <laughs> that's right Get it. Oh.